this is Podcast episode 49, Dark is Eternal, on Sunday, May 26th, 2019, and now given to the darkness, being morticians and stuff. This episode of Podcast is hosted by, and don't quote me on this, Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash PK49. Can you see the light now? Hi, everybody. Hey. Hello. How's it going? It's going well. It's going well. Jinx, hey, there's a motorcycle going by. Sorry if you hear that. See, I, you can't hear motorcycles on my feed because I am in a windowless room. Good. Good Good sound quality there. That was, yeah, that was that was darker than I anticipated it being. But in retrospect, it was probably actually exactly Are you actually in prison? No. Like, are you, do you need help? <laughs> Oh man, there's a yeah, no, no. It's just great because now I'm isolated from my AC, which is important. Uh, yeah, we all we all like you for that. Hope you don't, don't get too toasty. Yeah, there's no there's no isolating me from my MacBook fan. Yeah, exactly. It's all good. Well, we have some uh, stuff to talk about this episode. Um, I think most recently we can do something we all attended this week, which was Open Source North. Yeah, so good. Is this the first time that all three of us have gone to Open Source North, or did we all go to Open Source North last year too? I did not. Okay. Yes, so I think this is the first for all three. Because, Bre- uh, Ryan, you went two years ago, right? I went two years ago, and I think Brandon couldn't go, and I don't think you went either. Yeah, last year was my first year. This is my second. And, Brandon, when have you gone? Uh, I just went last year and this year, and the hilarious thing is I was supposed to go two years ago, but um, uh, at JSMN, we got turned around as to whether we were tabling at Open Source North or Minibar. So I showed up at Minibar, and other folks showed up at Open Source North, and it turns out we had tables at neither. Um, it was very entertaining. Um, <laughs> that is funny. That is entertaining. Yep, it was fun. Uh, but uh, this this year it all worked out, and we even raffled off some, some fun t-shirts, so that was cool. Yeah. Yeah, so Brandon and I were tabling for JavaScript Minnesota, but Brandon was also like prepping for a talk all day, and Ryan was the, the actual attendee just attending yep. and seeing all the cool talks. Exactly. Uh, so I thought, uh, so one of the things I like about Open Source North is that it's local. Uh, it's just, it's literally down the street from either office that I typically work at, which is really nice. nice. Uh, and then in addition to that, it's it's like broadly topicked. So there's front end, there's back end, there's DevOps, there's data, there's, there, and, and there's even like, um, like leadership and management tracks like it, it, there's so many different talks you can go to and i i really like that um i've gone to like midwest js which is all just about uh, i don't know midwest i don't even know if it's about js at this point um <laughs> the logo is literally a cow so maybe <laughs> so I, I i like uh midwest js but i like open source north much more because it's so broad I, I liked your I liked your post, Ryan, about um, the the conference that you put on on a GitHub Gist, and I'll link that in the show notes. Um, that it's a good like generalist conference for um, first time uh, conference attendees or something. Um, I don't know if you actually put that in your post, but you said that at one point. And I've I said that it. over the years, and I th- I still think that's true. It's a small smaller conference. It's actually quite inexpensive to attend. Two hundred dollars, I think, for I mean, that was the early bird price, but there's no late bird price now because it's sold sold out instantly. The early bird was by time available, right? Not by ticket sold. I believe so, yes. Yeah. So every bird, every ticket was early bird. Yeah. And you get like some breakfast and some coffee, a lunch and pizza slash happy hour. So yeah, there's a lot of food that comes with it. Um, yeah, it was like 700 some people. Yeah. So I had a great time just talking with uh, attendees and people that I've seen around over the last couple of years. Yep. There are a bunch of sponsor booths, so you could pick up some some goodies or trinkets if that's your thing. Yeah. Did did you did you both play bingo? I did. Did not win, unfortunately. I didn't win either. I did not play bingo. I tried last year, um, and this year I was just like, I'm going to be spending literally the first half of the conference agonizing over my talk, <laughs> and so probably best to just not um but uh i think like the way that osn does sponsorship and kind of community group stuff is is really kind of a um 
uh, unique among conferences, I feel like. I've gone mm-hmm. to a lot of other conferences that do it in different ways, um, where the sponsors can have this kind of, like, uh, you know, uh, awkward or kind of unpleasant presence. But really, like, the sponsors and the meetups, I, th- I think maybe, like, the core thing that they do differently is, like, sponsors and meetups are kind of given equal footing. And, yep. um, you know with that bingo card basically folks go around and meet everybody all the sponsors all the meetups and that's that's how you that's how you do it so there's kind of this shared sort of thing where it's like yeah if you're just here for the sticker that's fine nobody's gonna like intercept you and sales pitch yeah really right well. but if, but oftentimes you fix like you, you meet up with folks and um and they actually do want to hear about what what it is this group is or this sponsor does or stuff like that and um uh, I think it's a really great way to make that interaction kind of low friction and like, you know, mm-hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't really necessarily mean anything if you just walk up to a table. Um, but, but some, you can also get some great conversations out of that. And that's really like something that OSN does differently than any other conference I would say in town or elsewhere. Mm-hmm. For sure. And it's, it's uh, in some ways OSN is kind of like a, mini recruiting event for those sponsors and so they don't feel like they have to go too far out of their way like they know you're here for the conference but they get to use it for their purpose too um yeah what i also did was talk to those a lot of a lot of the sponsors had uh engineers with them in some capacity either if they were just hanging out by the table between talks or you know just over lunch and so i actually talked with some of the engineers just about like you know what they were working on and what their platforms are like and i kind of like that it's kind of nice to actually be able to talk to somebody more than just a recruiter totally yeah also just like the folks who run open source north are just like the kindest most like uh you know kind of with it uh conference organizers i've encountered in town here so it's it's good stuff um so so brandon you did a talk um location-based ar and yeah. uh, I I did attend that, and I thought it was a pretty good one. Awesome, yeah, thanks. No, it was it was wild. I probably practiced it six or eight times, and uh, rewrote it probably four or five times, and made some fun little graphics. And the graphics crashed Keynote, so I re-exported <laughs> them in the hour before my talk. So that was nice. fun. Nice. Uh, what, what I made a I made a really fun. I thought it was really funny. Um, I don't know. So, so the premise of your talk was how do we put a digital sign above a landmark? Like it's yep. a simple enough goal, simple enough app yep. to build. Totally great. And uh, in one of your slides, it was just a blue box with some white text. It me, I yep. believe it was. Um, and then I tweeted, "Is that a Flutter app?" <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I can't believe I didn't see that because that is that is a great joke. It's, That's awesome. It's like Google Blue. <laughs> yeah, it was. i thought it was pretty funny Uh, i did annotate in the tweet that i am totally joking but uh maybe not no i get you i get you and i have been working with flutter recently so i uh i get you there but there's there's more than enough uh words from that for for the next pod kit we're all have actually dug in about a little more yes yes exactly uh so did you actually get to see any other talks uh, yeah, I saw Todd Gardner's uh, in the first slot uh, about testing, uh, cool. like lessons from testing that you learn from failed projects, I think is a, a really like butchered version of that title. Um, but basically, Todd walked us through five projects that he's worked on and things he learned about how to test software from each of them. And I thought it was really great because a lot of the you know a lot of the software testing talks that i attend are all like very dogmatic Mm -hmm. and todd is not um and decidedly not and you know like some of the core lessons were things like uh you know code coverage is a perverse incentive like it's a it's a it's a bad metric that that causes you know folks to optimize for um for meeting the metric rather than actually running quality tests um you know uh, you need to use the kind of like the testing pyramid is kind of out of date or not really applicable to most folks because I, and I really resonated, this really resonated with me because, um, in consulting and in advertising, like a lot of times unit tests aren't the most useful way to validate that your application does what you want it to do. Oftentimes really the, you know, you, you'll still need unit tests, but you know, 100% code coverage and unit tests 
isn't going to help you in the same way that integration tests help you make sure that um, the crucial highest risk parts of the app are working. Um, and, you know, then beyond that, Todd was talking about things like, um, you know, you can test all you want, but if you skipped user testing, if you, if you, if you didn't know whether or not the, the product you were making actually satisfied a, a need or a, a problem for users, um, then all of your work was for naught. And so, um, I don't know that that's, that sort of talk is always really interesting to me, even if it's, you know, um, it's stuff that maybe I have heard before from Todd personally or from other, from other engineers personally. Right. Um, yep. it's always good. I feel like, especially in that setting, a very like enterprisey conference setting, it's always really great to, um, to see somebody up there, especially somebody like Todd who's, who's, um, you know, kind of uh, been a mentor to me and like, uh, uh, kind of a pillar of the community. Right. Um, it's, it's awesome to have that kind of attitude up there on stage. I feel like for sure, not just TDD, all the things. I haven't ever really done TDD. Well, right. anyway, um, yeah. OSN is great. I think I, so I tabled for two of the talks yeah. or during two of them and I went to four and of those two of them were really good. The other two were poor choices on my part of there are things that I already kind of had some familiar familiarity and understanding of. Uh-huh. And so I didn't really learn very much. So it, I guess it reaffirmed some things that I knew, but um, I probably could have gone to some better talks, but that's on me. And that's something I need to improve as I keep going to conferences. <laughs> yeah, I will. Uh, I, I will say there, Brian. I have the same issue. So in the in the first slot of OSN, I went to the from SharePoint to Gatsby talk, thinking, "Oh my gosh, this guy is going to talk about how he conned his business into using Gatsby instead of using SharePoint." Oh my gosh, this is going to be amazing! And it right, turns yeah, out that sounds awesome. Yeah, I know, right? And it turns out that's not what it was at all. It was not anything about SharePoint. SharePoint was just there for a historical reference of, yeah, everybody uses SharePoint for the static website because it's easy, not because they should. Oh, that's not what I wanted to hear. Thanks for playing, though. Yeah. Yeah, and so the titles of some of the talks might be a little bit a little bit misleading. There's no way um, to know until you get there, kind of, in some of those situations. Oh, yeah, and I will freely admit mine was kind of like that, too. My, almost everything that I thought was salient about what I was talking about had very little to do with React Native, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, I could have talked for hours and hours about it, but when I uh, converted my talk down to a 25-minute, um, it's like, well, I guess all the React Native stuff has to be cut, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, but. you did say this was all in the premise of React Native, which is enough for me. All right. Nah, I don't know. I, th- I think if I give it, if I gave a longer talk, it would probably have more React Native stuff in it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think one of the other things too is the CFP process for OSN is kind of super, super long, and I think that's a good thing. But like a lot, a lot of folks, I think probably submitted their abstracts in like December or January, right? And then promptly, you know, did next to no work on it until March or April, right? Um, yeah, May first. And yeah, ex- exactly, right? And it's like, well, when that when that happens, you're gonna f- discover a lot about your abstract that maybe no longer applies because I don't know, stuff happens. Yeah. I saw there was one abstract about GitHub um, saying GitHub Actions currently in beta or alpha or like yeah. currently announced, and it's been out for a couple of months now. But yeah, you know, it's how it goes. Yeah, it is how it goes. <laughs> All right. Um, should we talk about an, our next topic? Yes. Yeah. Tell us about TypeScript. All right. Well, you know, I'm a fan of TypeScript, and so I'm just trying to keep it coming up in, in our episodes here. So. The TypeScript 3.5 release candidate is out. Um, adds a few new improvements, such as speed improvements. Um, they are speeding up type checking. Um, it really ben- or is impactful if you use styled components, which I do at my work. And um, I think they shipped something in TypeScript 3.4 that added incremental compile stuff. Mm. And um, 
it actually reduced performance quite a lot for Oops. top components. So they've fixed that, which is awesome. Um, there's an emit helper type, which is something that I've defined. It's like a one line thing. It's um, uh, emit is basically a type that takes two generics and um, it is combining pick and exclude. So you can basically say emit property from uh, another interface or another type. And uh-huh. so it's like take everything but skip this one. So it's super, it's like a one liner helper, but everyone had been like copying it and putting it in their gener- or in their global app types and but uh now it's included in typescript itself i just nice. i just want to i just want to pause you there for a moment uh i don't know how many of you've worked with java or a uh non javascript language i don't know when i see that when i see the type of mit t extends blah 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 it's like whoa this is going back to what we all hated about all those things we hated but on the other hand, it's not even as if Java could have ever done this. This is incredible. Right. Like, this is just a, a, a monumental achievement for type systems. And the fact that it's all fake, like it is totally just grafted on into a language. It's barely a real language. It's just amazing. I love TypeScript. It's so cool. I know. That's great. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's handy. You know, it's not like a traditional, like, object-oriented and, you know, interface you know extends that kind of stuff yes um emitting something from an extend you know if you extend another type or another interface and then emit stuff is it really extending it and yes i guess if you over write it overload it yeah to it's be something else it's it's, but... it's just it's very difficult to think in the normal uh statically minded mindset when you're thinking about um so i i sort of see these things as dynamic structs and for example, Java does not have a struct, and it does, certainly doesn't have gen- dynamic structs. Right. So this this enables that kind of thinking. Yeah, um, and I think just to provide an example of where I've used emit um, in my app at work, we have um, you know routes that need to be secured due to various conditions, and so I built like a secured route that wraps around the React Router route component, mm-hmm. and so I have secured route. Um, the props for that extend the React Router route props, but I omit um, render and children. And I think I have it only render through the component, which then I, under the hood, render as a render prop to the route component with some other stuff. Great. But it, it the types are all the same, and I'm just like, you know, I, I could use pick and pick off like four or five props from it, but I'll just use omit and skip the one or two that I don't care about. Right. And it works very well. Um, there's some improvements to uh, union type checking. Um, I haven't looked tons into it, but it seems a little more strict in terms of uh, unioning two types together. Um, I don't know, UMD global access. I'm not going to use that ever. <laughs> Same spaces, don't use that. Um, what else do we have? High order type inference from generic constructors. Cool. I don't know if I'll use that. But I don't know. There's those kind of the omit and the speed changes. Oh, uh, breaking change to generic type parameters are implicitly constrained to unknown. So if you use generics, you might have some different experiences about where or what your types are initialized to. Huh. I don't know. Maybe. I haven't looked too much into it. We'll see. I haven't actually installed TypeScript 3.5 release candidate in, to any app, but I am excited to once it comes out. Nice. Perfect. That's about all I got. Well, there's more for you, Brian. Tell me about this website. Uh, yes. This is uh, a, a website that I run called brianm.me, where you can find stuff that I write about and find me on the internet and things like that the use of emoji um, on this website is just incredible yeah gotta have your emoji um yeah so it's just my personal website runs on jekyll um a couple weeks ago i spent like an entire weekend i put like 12 to 18 hours into this it was absurd but it now listens to the prefers theme media query 
Is that what it's called, actually? Let me look this I up. Think so. Is there a way to toggle it without that? If you open it in Safari, in the dev tools, there's the um, there's a button you can click which toggles that media query. So the answer was no, from what I heard. Um, also, if you're on Mac OS and you have an app like Night Owl, is that what it's called? I think. So That's I also tested. What, what I've heard is also no. Um, yeah, it's kind of a... Um, the the media queries prefers color theme by the way um yeah it's it's a niche feature that will just kind of appear and make your site look great in the environment that the user has kind of set up for themselves so if it doesn't support it it looks like a white website like everything else uh-huh. if your computer does support it which is right now safari l- latest firefox and chrome canary maybe even beta at this point i'm not sure so it's coming out very soon here across all the browsers, if not already. Um, and so, you know, if your computer's set to night theme or dark theme, then um, the website will just look how it how you would expect it to. And so I thought about trying to build in a toggle or something, but that sounded like too much work. Mm. And then how do you deal with when it is set, but your OS is set to something else? And, like, when do you eventually reset it or... I don't know. So it's just like I'm just not going to deal with it. And <laughs> I see that it'll be fine. because all of the poor Windows users are going to have to stare at this white website now. But Windows has a dark theme. Yeah, but and nobody I think knows. It's going to toggle that media query too. And nobody knows how to use it on Windows. Well, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's what I always say to Windows users. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm I built it through. So there's a. You know, CSS media query, you can do app media and then prefers color theme, light or dark or, you know, default to, I think I, I default to light. So I chose to not quite do it through CSS at all, but I have a, let me pull up the file here, but it's a JavaScript file that looks for the class name themable on any, on any element. And then it goes through and... Um, adds the class UK light or removes the class UK or uh, UK dark, which is from the UI kit uh, CSS library that I use on my website. Nice. So it's basically swapping all of it and using the built-in kind of present dark theme support in there. Um, I also have a few extra classes that, um, um, or a few overrides in my CSS that add better support with that UK light. So I, I set something as themable through the themable class, and then it's actually themed with the UK light, UK dark, which is actually opposite. So if I put UK light on HTML, it sets it up for a dark theme because it's telling the text to render as light. Oh, That's man. It's set up. That's wild. So it's, I mean, it's kind of like thrown together. It's a weird... A weird mess of things and this javascript isn't amazing or by any means but and it actually will um straight up error on ie 11 but whatever because i use const but ie 11 doesn't support it anyway so you know whatever yeah if you're using ie 11 that's your own punishment yeah i just feel a little bad about doing i don't know maybe i shouldn't i feel uh, like this is gross stuff because i'm doing like app wide javascript not using React, but it's probably totally fine. For this, it's great. This is exactly what it's for. Uh, for fun, while you were talking about that, I actually, I actually did open IE 11. <laughs> how, does, how does it work? Uh-oh. How does it look? I, I posted a picture in Slack for you. Uh, yeah, because I've never... Your oh, is, actually... Your image is a little wide. <laughs> That's it. I actually did try this in IE 11, and yeah, I don't know why, but the image is, is uh, <laughs> stretched wider than it is tall. And I was trying to figure that out, and I was like, you know... Eh. This Who makes cares? no sense to me. It doesn't it's matter. Like a min height, max height, min width, min width, min height sort of thing, something like that. Something like that, and then you know, with height auto or something. Oh, I don't know. yeah. Whatever. It looks fine every other place in the in the app, as far as I can tell. Uh, yeah. I mean, can they even get to BrianM.me without without uh, you know, with with Google or something? Won't Google give them a notification like, "Hey, get the hell off IE." <laughs> Uh no. If they don't, they should. But I, I don't. I think the Google still supports IE11. There was a story about that once. Aww. <sighs> so it works mostly well in all browsers, except a little weird in IE11. Yeah. But yeah, so... that's that's what I ended up doing. Um, 
I decided to support both the media query. So I'm using window.match media, yep. which is supported, I think, in IE 10 and above, surprisingly, maybe 11. Oh, it is surprising. And then, so earlier versions of that used media query, or it returns a media query list, and that has add, a, add listener and remove listener on it. Um, and then later, they actually had that just extend the event object, which is add event listener. Uh-huh. Um, but a lot of browsers don't include that yet, or it's relatively new. So I just check for add event listener and use that if it's there. That's that's my experience with dark and light theme. Um, I would like to eventually use CSS variables, but that is not going to happen when I'm using a CSS framework that doesn't right. really use it. So, right. so I have... Uh... I, I, I know you did this a couple of weeks ago, I think, if that's when it was, and uh, I, I like the idea of it, so I've been working on my own site and uh, converting it to styled component. Yeah, yeah. And so I'll probably end up doing something similar with uh, the prefers theme thing. Because styled components has the concept of like an app theme. Yes, it does. So you can kind of inject that all the way through. Yep, and it will be very simple to do that once I get it all converted over i'm also taking the time to convert it from oh my gosh these awful class components to just normal functional components like i don't know how people lived in the old days. my ears <laughs> right that's great yeah is this your ryan rambert said.com site yes yes it is nice i look forward to it yep it'll look exactly the same it'll just be less css-y but if you're doing um theme support then you're gonna add a light theme to your site Oh no! I'm just gonna change. Uh, dark is dark is internal. Uh, <laughs> something will change, but not not the background. Okay. It's gonna display a message saying "Highlight theme users." I'm ignoring you. <laughs> Can you see the light now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yep. Well, hey, I uh, got some fun news this week. Uh, it sounds like Apple uh, is. Releasing a slightly updated MacBook Pro. I presume presumably this would be called like the early 2019 MacBook Pros. Uh, you get the new ninth generation Intel processors that are up to eight cores, and uh, most entertainingly, they claim to have fixed the keyboard issues again. Again, um, but not really. Yeah. So like, uh, let's see. Uh, so the the first iteration back in 2016, right? I think that was right. Yep. In, tw- in 2016, they introduced that new butterfly keyboard mechanism, uh, which, you know, uh, at the company I worked at at the time, uh, everyone who got one, their keyboards were all gunked up and unusable uh, within like six months and had to have keys replaced and keep entire keyboards replaced, stuff like that. Even if they didn't like, you know, pour a soda in their keyboard, it was just like regular old through regular old use. Uh, and then in 2017, they claimed to fix it by adding some, like, spacers or something like that uh, underneath the keys. Um, and that clearly didn't work uh, because then in 2018, they claimed to isolate the keys a little bit better to protect them from dust, which is what the ver- iteration I have. With a membrane. Uh, with a membrane. That was it. With membranes. It, and that, I would say, that changes how it feels and how it sounds when you type as well. Yeah. And I prefer that over the 2017 model which is what i have at work yep i'm also Definitely. using it's a 17 at work and uh i have tried the new 18 models and well they're not new anymore uh and they do sound all, quite quite a bit quieter to me as well yeah and I, i've got that 2018 as well and it's it's just fine i'm i'm cool with it but in 2019 they claim to have changed a couple of materials as far as i've read it doesn't sound like there's any mechanical difference but they've just tried to maybe isolate it a little better with that um, and it, the internet is not convinced, <laughs> to say the least. So what do you guys to heard say, about these things? To, to say the least, I am also not convinced. Um, yeah, we have a, a bunch of interns starting at work right now um, for both places I work at. And, um, you know, they're going to be getting computers. And I assume they're going to be getting new MacBook Pros, most likely. Um and like that's fine like you're going to need a computer so what are you going to get a macbook pro or or not well of course you are right. but it's still a bummer that we still have to pay three thousand dollars for a computer that could have it any individual key of a hundred keys just flake out 
And then what is the solution? Not to just replace the key, but to literally rip off the top of the computer and then replace it. Right. And by top, you mean pull everything out because it's really the bottom when you open the computer up. The top, but from the bottom, yes. Exactly. Right. Um, I fixed it had a teardown, and they showed some of the differences in components. Um, I think they have a little video, too. Yeah, it's as Brendan said, it's the same mechanic mechanics, but different uh, materials. Um, I just I love when you open up one of these computers. It looks like an owl, an angry owl. You know the two fans and the, so the, lo- the eyebrow in the middle. Yeah, that's the, that's the that's the um, hardware modification protection feature. It's supposed <laughs> to elicit like a a biological fear response from anyone uh, daring enough to to open to remove the back panel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I'll just read some of what iFixit said. They said, so what changed this year? First, the transparent switch cover material. The cover on the 2018 model is semi-opaque, somewhat tacky, and feels like silicone. The new model is clear and smooth to the touch. So that way, you can see the dirt under it better. Exactly. <laughs> so you can identify which key is broken. Yes. Um, they used, uh, they analyzed the materials using a Fourier transform infrared spectros- spectroscopy. So they shined infrared infrared light at the stuff and figured out what materials it was what else changed they think the metal dome switch may have um the dome um is like a really tiny jam lid or snapple cap kind of you press it down and it springs back up huh. um it looks like that changed it's just aluminum foil now <laughs> just regular old yep. reynolds wrap yep breaks on the first key press oh man um, so I don't know. That material is different, at least. So that's kind of neat, neat to hear about. I think. Don't quote me on this, um, though. I'm saying in a podcast, so who knows what's <laughs> going on anyway. Um, I thought I saw on Twitter that they included these new models for the keyboard replacement program, and they just blankly said, four years from manufacturer, you're covered," or something like that, oh. for out of warranty replacement. Maybe that's not right, but I know at least the 2018 models were added to the replacement program. So I added this video from uh, Dave2D's YouTube channel. Uh, There's there's a funny like intro and a funny outro, but in the core of the content, the non-funny, actually serious mini review part, um, he actually mentions that the 18 models and the 19 models were just added to that repair plan. Uh, So even the new ones that were just produced these 2019 models are also in that so it makes you wonder does apple even care anymore yeah apple's probably not very confident i mean maybe new materials will help a little bit but yeah yeah they need a new keyboard at this point i I think they've just bitten the bullet and just anything they can do to keep people buying it so i have to say my favorite keyboard to type on like ever of all time is the magic keyboard too. Right. It uses the scissor switch, but it's way smaller than any other scissor switch Apple's made. So it's almost like it's one of the new butterfly keyboards, except they're a little bit taller and they travel a little more. Yeah. But they're amazing. They're really, they're still really slim, but maybe double the, the, the press height of a MacBook pro. Right. And why can't they use that? It's so nice. But the computer would be a millimeter thicker. Oh, no. Oh, no. Can't handle that. Yeah. uh, So I think last time we talked about the rumored um, 16-inch MacBook Pro. Do you think having this refresh uh, pretty much just seals the deal and not getting that anytime soon? I think that could still come around, but it might be like that might be next year's MacBook Pro. Maybe it leaked really early in the life cycle of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical that it's coming anytime soon now. I'm kind of thinking, yeah, next year. So speaking of Apple things coming, maybe maybe not next year, but this year. WWDC is coming up uh, in a week from now. Yes, sure enough. Lots of things have been rumored to exist. What have you guys heard? Truly indeed. Uh, you know, I actually haven't heard pretty much anything this time because... I've been so busy and out of the loop. Uh, I don't know if I know anything about this. I am going to um, go and look at the... So every time they make a a WWDC for every year, they they have a website and they have invites that go out. 
and the invites usually have some kind of graphics on them. And this time, it's an alien with its head exploding. Yeah, <laughs> it, um, yeah aliens are coming to iOS 13. Yeah, so it's it. I, I, all I can say is that it's going to be out of this world. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, uh, the big things I've heard are probably, you know, marzipan is the big thing, right? Coming to Mac OS. And with that, there are going to probably be some changes to iOS that bring some Mac OS features to iOS and vice versa, you know, iOS features to Mac OS. Um, I think with that is going to bring a dark theme to iOS because the Mac has it. And so for these iOS apps that are ported to the Mac through Marzipan, and then if they need to look good on a dark theme, like my website, they need to support dark theme. So I think that's coming. Um, lots of Marzipan stuff, I'm sure. Steve Trout Smith has been doing a lot of work about Marzipanify, his tool he made last summer to convert a uh, simulator build to a Marzipan app. Yeah, cool new stuff. So what what are what are, like we have to I have three question marks here that we need to fill in. We need to make three predictions of things that we're going to get. Okay, you f- you fill in the first one, I'll fill in the second one. All right. Thanks. Uh so AR kit with rear facing lasers. Absolutely. Okay, tell so, me more. Uh Apple bought the original company that makes the uh the the first iteration of the Microsoft Connect. Um, which is widely regarded to be probably the the best, uh, especially for like uh, hackability purposes. So like a lot of folks in the creative tech space use the original Connect in like interactive installations and depth sensing and stuff. The fun part is that exact same hardware made its way into the iPhone 10 and 10s uh, and 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 tennis Max. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that at this point. Uh, that's mostly been used for the Animoji feature. But the thing that we actually, uh, the, the thing that'll actually bring the most value, especially to ARKit for this, is having those same that same technology on the rear-facing camera. Um, and Apple's kind of teased this a little bit um, with integrating what they call like, like, like stereoscopic like cameras, like the support for stereoscopic stuff in ARKit. Um, that's been kind of an overarching rumor in the kind of AR community that Apple's going to support this stuff. There's some third-party things that do it too, but I think what we're going to see is at WWDC is the groundwork being laid for an iPhone with a rear-facing kind of Kinect-like apparatus that is going to enhance the way you're able to track depth and do like uh, HoloLens-style occlusion things. So like you can have 3D objects that look like they're behind things or in front of things. And that's going to be the biggest, in my estimation, the biggest thing to hit AR kit since like vertical plane detection. Cool. So there you go. There, you know, there there are rumors of the iPhone having four camera modules on the back next year, or I guess later this year. Jeez. I mean, what 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 if what if one of those isn't actually a camera module? It's actually a laser. Yeah, exactly. Why not just put a laser pew, pew, pew. on it? Uh, I have a uh, much more uh, less useful speculation. Like Brandon's speculation is actually useful and important and could, you know, be innovative. Mine is just like low-level fruit that we need to pick, and that is putting apps anywhere on any of the home screens. None of this nonsense sorting nonsense. Well, this might be related to the rumor a year ago that the iPad would have a redesigned home screen. And then that never came, and I think that was around the time when we got the leak that Apple was uh, promoting stability and, you know, uh, speed improvements over new features. So that might – I could see that coming. I like it, ha- it. It, it has to be here. Otherwise, I can't buy it. So yeah, get, get to it, Apple. I would like to see a cool, uh, you know, in a dark environment, kind of like the Google Pixel phones have. Um, when you take a photo in a really dark place, it lightens it up with oh, crazy right. machine learning things. Yes, Night think, Sight. Night Sight, that's what it is. Thank you. I think Apple could bring that to iOS. Now, that would probably be locked to a hardware release because they'd be ridiculous not to do that. But, yeah, I'd yeah. like to see that coming. 
Make it, it, all the phones have that at this point. Samsung is getting a software update to the S10 line that will enable that, and the P30 from Huawei, which no longer exists as a company, as far as I know, um, they also have that capability. Yeah, my more official thing is dark mode is coming. It's iOS. My, yeah. Nice. Um, Perfect. We can briefly go through this Bloomberg thing if we want to just like list off a bunch of changes, at least okay. the bigger ones. Let's do it. Um, you think see. you're getting a new watch this year? Me, like me personally? No, no, no. Like you, you, the industry, or <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. I okay. mean, they've, they've released a new one every year, other than um. So the first one came out in May of 2015, and then when did the series one and two come out? Was that I think that was a year and a half later. Yeah, like late 2016, early 2017, something like that. Yeah, and then they released the series three in the fall of 20. Uh, 17? Yeah, 17. And then the Series 4 is fall of 2018. So I bet another one this fall. Yeah, the thing that's always tricky with WWDC is that there's not it's not really a hardware event, unless that hardware is like a Mac Pro or a MacBook Pro. But we might see the software underpinnings for it. I'm hoping we'll see a Mac Pro teaser, but I don't know. Um, okay, so Bloomberg is saying that we'll see for the second year in a row a speed up for devices and reduce bugs. Uh, dark mode, um, new keyboard option to allow swiping on the keyboard. So like those third party swipe apps, but this will be first party, um, improve or a revamped health app, um, that improves like homepage metrics and bringing up stuff that you want to see more often, um, hearing health, maybe, um, a like screen sharing feature similar to duet display and Luna display. So you can use your iPad as a second screen for a Mac, uh, update a reminders app, um, a new feature in screen time for parental controls um, that allow um, like people to not contact other people at certain times of the day. Um, refreshed Apple Books app. Um, IMAS- uh, iMessage might get some WhatsApp-like enhancements for, like, I don't know, profile pictures or something like that. Uh, updated maps that might show frequent locations or something like that. Um, merging of Find My Friends and Find My iPhone. Um, updated mail app for muting, um, system wide sleep mode that might be tied in with the bedtime tab in the clock app, uh, upgraded home app, multi users for home pod, maybe more organized share sheet, uh, download manager. That would be surprising to me. That might just be like a location in the files app and some enhancements there. Um, maybe some interface changes to multitasking, iPad home screen, or probably iOS too, I hope. Um, maybe mul- opening up an app multiple instances so you can, you know, work on two documents at once, for example. I would, I would love to be able to have two slacks open on my phone. One for work and one for me. Yeah, that would be interesting. Um, for the Mac, it's, you know, marzipan... Marzipan, Marzipan, uh, new music app, which I've heard a little bit about that it was, it would basically be the music parts of iTunes in its own app. So probably further splitting out iTunes. I could almost see it as they have legacy iTunes in the applications utilities folder and they have the new music iTunes in the applications folder. Um, I saw that, uh, I got an, a software update for like, I, iOS or iPod hardware support. So I think they're already kind of splitting apart the hardware support in iTunes from the, you know, user interface and the app itself. Um, what I, another thing for the Mac, which I can only assume is messages app would be marzipanified. Um, that would include things like effects and stickers because that's all written for iOS. Um, watch OS. What are we going to get an app store directly to the watch? Maybe, um, voice memos on the watch, um, an emoji and memoji stickers, uh, Apple books app for listening to audiobooks and a calculator app. Um, there might be a, um, two new apps for health related one called doze for pills and one called cycles for menstrual cycles. Um, 
a new watch face called Complications. Um, and other new watch faces like a gradient one or some extra large ones. Solar analog. Infograph subdial. Yeah, that's that's the Bloomberg article. Yeah, I think some of that might just be speculation. I don't know if we're going to get all of that. So yeah. uh, you did mention one important thing that we should mention. What do you think about that um, Mac Pro? Uh, this year. That's what <laughs> Apple said two years ago, right? So so do we think they're going to do, do like the um, HomePod kind of thing where they're like, show it now and give it to you later? I, I think – I mean, yeah. I think it's good to be, to give – the industry some leads on what it's going to be so they can plan for it. I mean, Maybe. they don't have to really plan for much. I mean, presumably what you do is you go to apple.com slash Mac Pro and you hit the buy button, you put your credit card in, and then you get one in two to three days. True. Um, yeah, I don't know. It depends how excited they are and how much stuff they have to talk about. I think just software improvements alone would be enough for WWDC. So it's really interesting because a few weeks ago, uh, you know, Google I.O. came around and there were some improvements, not not like huge improvements or anything, but there were some improvements to like Android Studio and, uh, you know, Colin support for things. And, um, you know, of course, Flutter is a big thing right now, although it's from it's from Google. So who knows if it's going to last? Right. Uh, and then right before that, there was Build where they showed tons of new developer oriented changes for windows and uh development in the future um it kind of seems like apple hasn't done a big developer thing like you know changing the os features and you know adding capability that's that's what you do but where what where where has the big like swift like progress been uh and uh i feel like it's been a few years since i've heard about those big changes uh, Swift five got ABI stability, so that's good. Um, I think iOS twelve point three, sh- maybe twelve point two, shipped with the Swift runtime at an operating system level versus being bundled bundled into each application. So that's progress. It's, but it's there's more. Becoming more mature. There's more to do. Of course, it's still a pretty new language. No, but I don't mean just with Swift, but I mean just with all of Apple's developer experience. Uh, there's just there's still more more they sh- can do and should do, uh, especially when uh, a lot of attention is being given to others in that regard. Yeah. Cool. Uh, do you think it's that time, Brian? New Twitter followees. Hey, Brandon, take us away. So I joined the 21st century and uh, finally followed the creator of uh, a number of important frameworks like Lodash and Backbone. Uh, whose name is oh, Jason cool. Jason Ash Kennis. Um, and he used to work for the New York Times with uh, Mike Bostock and some other folks. And uh, now he's working on Observable, which is uh, Mike Bostock's company. The New York Times has put out so much cool stuff. It's insane. I saw a tweet, like, someone asking, how does an environment like the New York Times encourage such number of cool projects? Yeah. Um, fear, fear of extinction? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think I saw a thread about how basically the thing is they they like developers work with editorial and not necessary and aren't treated as like tech support, right? <laughs> and yeah. I think that's probably the critical the critical thing. Yeah, that that would do it. I'd love to tr- talk with a friend of the show Max Marty uh about his uh his feelings on on this on this stuff. I know he does some journalism stuff. Yes, he uh, he recently started working at a new company, uh, but he was at uh, one of our local newspapers for many years. Oh wow, this is very this is very recent. I did not know this. In fact, I was yeah. So wow, right on. Um, cool. So that's 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 fun stuff. Uh, I also followed um, at uh, I'm probably gonna mess this up, but Shubi S H U B I E on Twitter, who is a software engineer on the Google Chrome team who has lots of awesome uh, threads and context around what's going on with uh, Chrome as a platform and stuff like that. Whenever somebody joins the Chrome team, it's always good to see uh, their takes on stuff because Chrome is one of those things that drives the web forward. And last but not least, there is uh, at ConfBuddy, which is a app uh, that uh, allows you to kind of find folks who are 
uh, who, you know, they might be first time conference attendees, or this might be their first conference ever, or they just might want to uh, meet up with folks at conferences and, and not be like traveling with anybody else or um, just trying to find folks to hang out with. And uh, it's a, it's a really cool platform. And I've, I've often thought about building something not unlike this. So that's kind of a cool thing that somebody else has already done it. And we can just be like, Hey, that's cool and uh, use it. But uh, those are my Twitter followers so far. How about you, Brian? I followed several people as I've been ramping up my Twitter follows, which is terrible. Ugh, my life. No, it's great. Give into the darkness. Yeah, take away from my time. Um, okay, first of all, I followed Southwest LRT, which is the Twitter account for our new uh, light rail transit line that's being put in, mm-hmm. going from downtown Minneapolis to Eden Prairie. Um, so I followed it about the same time that they closed a much loved bike path here for three years. So the Cedar Trail the cedar lake trail and part of the kenilworth trail so yeah i followed it for cool photos of construction and for progress they tweet out a weekly update every friday i believe and so i read those links cool um gotta love our public transit uh next i followed um kate who goes by at uh s bin london um i followed a few people who were speakers and active on twitter from the react girls conf um i saw a lot of talk there and i need to watch a bunch of those talks um add to the list of cool things to spend a lot of time on um yeah so she's a london-based front-end react person there's a there's a tweet on her page um that's a, a chart of number of windows <laughs> it's pretty funny uh, that's a good one. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. For the Windows operating system, uh huh. Windows three point one ninety five ninety eight two thousand seven <laughs> eight point one ten. That's good. Yep. Um, and then finally, um, following the Twitter handle is Soylent Queen, and the 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 name is Nintendo dot DS Store, <laughs> as in DS underscore Store, like the Finder layout file anyway um i don't remember who retweeted her stuff but more good um i don't even remember i followed too many people to remember what everyone's interests are gosh uh i'm i'm terrible at this at this segment Anyway, just give her a follow. It's good. That's all right. Over time, you you will learn to join the ranks of those of us who follow almost five thousand people, and it will be great. If you if you miss I bet it, by the end of the year, you will actually follow five thousand. You're at forty two hundred something now, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Just g- give it one more conference, and I'll I'll be at five five k. Okay, I believe it is my turn, and I actually did follow people. It is. Oh, man, following people's hard. Uh, so I followed, uh, did you know, like, we went to Open Source North, but before that, we even went to Serverless MN. We didn't talk about Serverless MN. Oh, geez. How did we forget? Oh, that's right. Um, but uh, so I followed AJ, and he is from Serverless, yep. and that's very confusing because what is Serverless? It's a description of a type of technology, but it's also a framework and he is from the framework. He is the also a previous lead engineer from Sport Engine. And so I, I met him at Serverless MN, and he was uh, really fun to talk to, and it was, it was pretty cool. And I saw him give a talk the next day at Node MN at Sports <laughs> that, Engine. I, yeah. I see that here in the in the list, and that's that's pretty funny. And he retweeted some of my tweets, uh, specifically the SQL is the ultimate domain specific language, and then it's a uh, dollar bill with uh, deal with it glasses. Uh, and then I also followed uh, Adam Waythan, and he makes Tailwind CSS, which I've been tinkering with between um, uh, Style Component and, and Tailwind for just redesigning things in a different way and not necessarily using a pre-constructed CSS framework. So it's kind of an interesting idea. Nice. Uh, following people, it's it's not easy. You did it this this month, Ryan. Yeah, one, that's all you get for a whole another 60 days. All right. Well, uh, what's coming up here in the next little while? I know um, Brandon and I will be recording a Nexus special on WWDC. 
Yes, I will um, be traveling while uh, WWGC is going on. I'll attempt at watching some of the coverage, but I probably won't be participating in it directly, which is okay. Nice. Um, I don't know when the next podcast will be out. Um, I'm doing the MS-150 in mid-June. I should know the 8th and the 9th, so that's a big um bike weekend going from Duluth to the Twin Cities, 150 miles over two days. Uh, And then like not even a week later, I'm going to Europe for a vacation for two weeks. So So I'll see you on like July 5th. (laughs) I will be home. I get back on the 28th. So So July 5th. Sure. Yeah. July 5th. Let's do it. Perfect. Yeah. That sounds like what's going to happen. Perfect. Uh, From from May to July. That's, (laughs) That's good. It's perfect for us. So, uh, Brandon, where can we find you on the internet? You can find me just about anywhere, but particularly on Twitter, where my username is Brandon underscore MN, uh, and where I talk about things like people from high school adding me on LinkedIn, uh, and being like, I don't know, morticians and stuff, and we haven't spoken in like five, six, seven, ten years, uh, and why that entertains me. Uh, that was a good tweet. Thank you, thank you. I love. I used to use that SNL GIF. Uh, the the not gonna do it. That one. It's so good. So perfect. So prime. Uh, otherwise, you'll find me uh, hanging out at coffee shops in Northeast or Uptown Minneapolis, uh, where I'll be drinking uh, nitro cold brew uh, or regular cold brew. I'm not picky, uh, and probably working on React Native, Flutter, or any of the various other random things that I am working on now about how about you brian um you can find me on twitter at brian mitch l or my website brianm.me or now keybase which is keybase.io slash brian mitch l finally went and jumped on that train yes um yeah you can find me hanging around in uptown or working in eden prairie or traveling or biking that's what's coming up with me what about you ryan well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at RandomR, and of course on RyanRampersed.com, where I uh, will l- have a website that looks identical but be new. Hey. Wonderful. Oh my goodness, I almost forgot to mention, we have a JavaScript MN event coming up next week, Wednesday, so in five days as we as we record today. Not five days, three days. Nice. Not three days, four Perfect. days. Something like that. And it will be very great, and I should tweet about it at some point. And by the time I edit this, it'll probably be one or two days away. Oh my goodness. Well, you should go and RSVP at meetup.com slash JavaScript MN. Well, um, you can find uh, the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash PK49. Um, you can also chat about this episode on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv, or on Twitter, of course, too. Uh, we can also support us on Patreon, which is patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Uh, yeah. That's our show. I think that that's our show. Yeah, I, I hope stuff. it was, I hope it was really good and extra long this time as you won't hear from us until July. Uh, we could probably do late June. No, nope, maybe July. It'll only be like five or six weeks. It's not that bad. Time. Have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from from the the Technological technological convergence. Convergence.